thank you for joining our first uh, event uh, uh, for Mapping Global China. I am Maria Dele Carrai, and I'm an assistant professor in Global China Studies at New York University, uh, Shanghai. And this event uh, uh, is in partnership with the Center for Global Asia at New York University, Shanghai. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's meant to launch uh, uh, this research initiative called Mapping Global China that is uh, available uh, at mapglobalchina.com that uh, includes a very large data set of Chinese investments uh, overseas uh, and other uh, data and research brief uh, to better understand uh, the scope of uh, uh, global China. And today we're very lucky to have uh, three uh, very special guests uh, and I'm going to introduce you uh, them to you. So the first one is uh, Lauren Johnson, who is uh, an associate professor at the China Study Center at the University of Sydney, and also a consultant uh, uh, senior researcher in uh, foreign policy program at South Africa Institute of International Affairs. Uh, Dr. Lauren uh, holds uh, a PhD in economics from Peking University, and she has experience uh, in uh, and, and is widely published uh, on economics and political economy of China-Africa relations, the Belt and Road Initiative, and also how population aging is impacting Chinese uh, economy. Then we're also very lucky to have uh, with us today, Timothy Oates, uh, who is a professor of geography, cultural politics, economics, and social change in China at the University of Colorado uh, Boulder. And his work focuses on social and cultural transformation in contemporary China, and in particular, the uses and the reinvention of local culture as resource for economic development and governance objective. And currently, she's working on urban planning and infrastructure urbanism in China's new area of urban zone. And he's also the director of the project China Made, Asian Infrastructures and the China Model of Development, that uh, we hope you will uh, discuss more uh, today with us. Last but not least, we have uh, uh, my dear colleague, Professor Tan Tun Sen, who is the director of the Center for Global Asia. He's a professor of history at New York University, Shanghai, and an associate professor of history at uh, New York University. He specializes in Asian history and religion and has a special scholarly interest in India-China interactions, Indian Ocean connections, and Buddhism. And he's the author of many books, among which uh, Buddhism, Diplomacy and Trade, The Realignment of Sino-India Relations, uh, uh, India, China and the World, A Connected History. And uh, most recently, he's working on Zhenghe Exploration and Maritime Silk Road. Mm -hmm. uh, and so thank you so much for being here uh, today, uh, all of you. And I would like to start off with uh, a question that is uh, the title, the very title of our uh, panel today. What is global China? We hear it over and over more recently, you know, like the news, uh, global China here, global China there. Uh, it seems new, but probably it's, uh, you know, it has a longer history. And so I would like to start off with uh, Lauren, Timothy, and then Tansen um, answering this question based on the research and experience. So what is global China? Uh, Lauren, Thank you, everyone, for having me and for this invitation. It's great to join you all. Um, I, I, I'm going to take advantage of the fact this is a chat session as compared to a kind of a presenting a paper session. So on the question of what is global China, I'm kind of almost curious, is there such a pronoun? Can you even kind of use that as not pronoun, sorry, noun phrase? Can you even say global China? Like, I, I would never say global Australia or global Germany, where I'm currently sitting. So in that kind of a bit, bit you know, um, contentious start, I just think, what is global China if we wouldn't say global Germany or global Australia or global Spain? Um, and so with, with that said, I my background is an economist applied to China. So when I think of China in the world, what is, it can captured in this concept of global China. I think of aid, trade, and investment. You know, and obviously, in that sense, China in the world is rising in both relative and absolute presence. You know, trade, especially, it's been the it's now the the major export or even trade partner of I think 130 countries. I think she even mentioned that in his Congress speech. 
um, in aid, it's a very important bilateral concessional loan creditor, as well as a provider of loan of, of just of grants to a lot of the global south. And investment, I find that side of understanding what global China is much more difficult because obviously the investment is both this credit lending side, which the data for, and then it's FDI, it's foreign direct investment, which is super lumpy in for every country. So you can't have easy empirical studies of Chinese FDI and the definition changes across countries and so on. So kind of understanding trade is quite straightforward. Understanding aid a bit less so and understanding investment is for me sadly problematic because I think that's a very interesting lens on China in the world and is often confused between the financial side, the kind of credit side and the FDI side. Um, so I wish the China investment angle was better understood and there was much more data. And then I think we would have a better sense of what global China is, even though I don't believe in the phrase per se. Um, so that's, and so then a, a third point, and, and then obviously China in the world is so many other things. I've just said the economics lens, but it's kind of anything depending on what your lens is. You know, it's Zhonghe in a historical sense, it's security, it's whatever is your lens, it's TikTok, it's, you know, sunny equipment manufacturing, if you're someone else, like it really just depends who you are, where you are, and what time of day you're looking as to what China in the world is. Um, and so to, to that extent, I, I really think it means such different things at different times and different places to different people. So I, in, in, in my career, I have worked in Sierra Leone for a year, and that was in the mid 2000s. And China and just, this was just after a 12 year civil war. And China was one of the first bilateral donors to return to Sierra Leone after the war. A bit, and they, for example, even my office was in a Chinese built ministry building. So for one whole year, I worked in a Chinese built ministry building in Sierra Leone. And it was pretty much the first functional ministry compound again after the war. So if you were a Sierra Leonean in China, in sorry, in Sierra Leone after the war, China was running one of the main hotels. It was running one of the main industrial zones. Even my mechanic was a Chinese guy with some Chinese speaking staff. And then, but if you go to Melbourne, where I'm from, where I grew up, this is just a whole different story and intensity of relationships. That means migration, it means citizenship, it means study, it means gazillions of dollars in iron ore trade. It now means all sorts of other more contentious things. And so I, I just think global China um, is just everything and nothing all at the same time, just so many different people. It just depends what time of day, what news channel, um, what country you're in, what, what a, like just way too many things to, to too many, like you, you can't even put it. And then it depends your training. Are you an economist? Are you a historian? Are you a political studies person? And then finally, I guess the only, the only, the only way to kind of give a what is a, what is China in the world officially? So how does China describe itself? Globe, what is global China? And maybe there isn't one version of that, but from my lens, I would go back to the two launch speeches of the Belt and Road Initiative, even because I think the Global Development Initiative and Global Security Initiative kind of spring from that. Um, and she mentioned this in his Congress speech that the Belt and Road would, he hoped it would become a global public good platform. And so, you know, there's five policy pillars to each of those speeches. And, and I guess at the kind of official baseline, I would take those 10 policy pillars as what is global China per se, at least that's a kind of a, matrix by which you can maybe study it from an official lens. Um, I don't know if there's time. So the first, the Kazakh one is just, is strengthening policy communication, strengthening road connectivity, promoting unimpeded trade, 
strengthening currency circulation, people to people ties. And then the Indonesia speech is much more soft power based. So it's about maintaining and insisting on kind of win-win outcomes and mutual affinity and so on. So you have those two. And then of course there's China is, you know, like they say, fostering currency exchange, but at the moment the renminbi is barely exchanged at all given China's size. So there's many things China in the world that you might expect it to be. And then, you know, maybe in 10 years that will be completely different. So I think it's such a moving target and it's different for every person in every country. Um, thank you. Those are at least my starting comments. Thank you. And uh, I think it was a great opening of the discussion already and uh, providing like, you know, this uh, nuances and, and, you know, it's everything and nothing at the same time, depending on where you are, who you are and when you're looking. Uh, next, uh, we have Timothy. And so what is Global China uh, when you hear that, Tim? Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks. And uh, thanks for inviting me to be part of the panel. It's, it's really great to... Um, join all of you and and uh, speak to um, everybody who's listening um, and hope we have some good questions coming in as well. Um, I, I, I just want to start by um, uh, appreciating Lauren's initial comment about, can, you know, can we even say global China? Um, I think it's a great thing to put out there initially. Um, yeah, we wouldn't say global Australia, we wouldn't say global Germany. Um, and, I, and I totally get that. And I think that's a great way to start, but I also think that um, the idea of global China is um, is kind of necessary still, and hopefully maybe at some point we would be able to get to a point where we, where we don't need to kind of frame it that way. But right now I think it's, I think it signals an important intervention um, because there's, there's been such, um, such a non-global way of thinking about China for such a long time that I think this is, an idea that is kind of past due, um, and and something that uh, you know that still needs a lot of uh, a lot of attention in the China Studies field and and beyond, of course, as well. So I'm going to answer the question by saying that to me, global China first and foremost is an analytical framework um, and and a methodological orientation, um, and so that you know rather than thinking about a particular object of inquiry, uh, we can consider global China as a way of thinking about China um, uh, and, and a way of thinking about China that's that's long overdue, I think, um, which isn't to say that there are, haven't been a lot, not a lot of people out there who have been thinking about China in this way for a long time. And, and, and here I can um, mention uh, Tansen's work, for example, uh, the the book that uh, that you did with um, with Victor Mayer, I've used it in my Geography of China class um, as a way of kind of trying to get my students to think about China in some ways that go beyond some of the received kind of ways that they've kind of thought about China as this isolated cut off place that has its own history very separate from the rest of the world. Um, and so there's two there's two key key aspects I think that are important in terms of thinking about. Or, or global China as an analytical framework um, or methodological orientation. And the first for me is um, global China as a critique of Chinese exceptionalism, right? And, and so this of course is the idea that China is civilizationally unique, um, that it can't be compared to any other place, that it requires its own uh, special set of conceptual tools and approaches, that it operates by its own internal rules and logics that are that are difficult for outsiders to understand. Um, and, and the China studies field um, in large part has played a role in perpetuating this idea because part of the role of the China studies field was to train experts who could interpret China for the rest of us. Um, and doing that required a conceptual framing of China as something that was separate, something that was very different, something that was other to the rest of the world. Um, and global China is an approach which I think starts to undermine that that idea. And like I said, I think that's a that's a long overdue um, approach to breaking down some of those those older kind of exceptionalist traditions um, e, uh, of Sinology, of you know the long history of China hands and China experts translating and decode, decoding 
the otherwise inscrutable um, Chinese and, and China. Um, and so I think global China is, is a really helpful kind of intervention in that. But, you know, the interesting thing al along the lines of this issue of Chinese exceptionalism is that as we see, uh, you know, the, uh, um, the rise of, of, of China under Xi Jinping, um, the growth of Chinese nationalism, uh, books like Zhang Weiwei's um, China Wave, um, the more China becomes global in a sense, the more we see an assertion, I think, of that exceptionalist narrative, um, much in the same way that the United States promoted an exceptionalist narrative as it was also, um, you know, becoming more and more of a dominant um, global power uh, historically. Um, and so there's a greater and greater call for, um, for a critique of the of that of that approach, and I think global China, as an analytical framework, has the has the ability to do that. The other aspect of this, besides Chinese exceptionalism, that I wanted to highlight, is that global China can also be an important conceptual intervention into how we think about global capitalism um, and, and and global development, um, because you know in many ways China's presence, its increasingly um, active presence as a global capitalist player, as a global development actor, um, troubles our conventional binaries by which we've come to, you know, think about development and capitalism in the world, you know, north, south, first world, third world, so on and so forth. Um, China's involvement in the world has, you know, forces us to think in much more broad uh, terms, more flexible terms, I guess, about, about capitalism um, uh, with, with frameworks that, that make problematic some of our existing assumptions about things like neoliberalism, about neocolonialism, about empire, about these kinds of things. I think China has, is forcing its, its way into our conceptual frameworks in ways that, that can't be avoided. And I think global China is a really useful um, catch all of those kinds of issues. And so, you know, global China isn't just about China. It's about it's about capitalism. It's about it's about global processes that China is now an active player in and how that disrupts some of the taken for granted assumptions that that we might have about those processes that are much more rooted in 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 um, Western experience. Um, I guess that's that's most you know that's front and the, the the most important parts of global China for me, um, and you know there's a few other things I could say about global China empirically, but I'll leave those for um, for the uh, for the Q and A or for for the discussion. Thank you so much, Tim. And also, I want to remind you that you can start uh, writing your questions in the Q and A uh, uh, chat box, and so. Tantan, so what is going on China for you yeah. as a historian? Uh, yeah, as you know, Adele, both of us belong to a unit at NYU Shanghai that is called Global China. So we are part of, of imparting this knowledge that Tim was talking about, uh, looking at China from a global perspective. So that's an undergraduate major. So those of you uh, who don't know, NYU Shanghai uh, has a Global China major. Uh, and we are actually sitting at the NYU Shanghai office uh, on NYU campus. So that's global uh, NYU that we are present at. Um, I used to like the term that Lauren mentioned, China and the world, uh, but uh, I think it creates a binary uh, as if China versus the world. Uh, and then it creates uh, the, the issues that I think Tim was raising, the conceptualization of, of China. Uh, for me, there are, there are three aspects to global China. Uh, and then this is connected to the kind of research I've done uh, and the teaching I do. One is, uh, uh, is the presence of the world in China, um, uh, sites where the world converges uh, within China, different sites. Uh, for example, in present day, and this connects to Tim's issue of the capitalism is Tungguan, right? Uh, in Guangdong province or EU uh, in Zhejiang, where uh, various traders from different parts of the world come in pursuit of, of Chinese commodities. It creates a fascinating world onto itself within China. I, I think studying those sites uh, are, are quite important. That's part of global China. Uh, although the sites are in China, but it's, it's a global presence there. 
for me in particular, my own research uh, focused uh, earlier on on this mountain called Utashan um, near Beijing, where initially uh, Buddhist monks from different parts of the Buddhist world would come on pilgrimage. Right? Later on during the Qing dynasty, it became a place or a site where uh, the Manchu, the Han, and the Tibetans met. Uh, I would say that's a global China site uh, within the borders of, of China. Uh, the second uh, aspect for me is how uh, uh, China is connected. So I think the conceptual uh, idea that perhaps Tim can talk about more uh, is also connectivity, right? Um, uh, and then that's the argument that Victor May and I were making, uh, making our, our uh, theses work from AS about how traditional China was not separated from other places, it was quite integrated. Um, so when I, when I look at that connectivity through the movement of silk, for example, porcelain, a movement of ideas like Buddhism, Islam coming to China, or Chinese ideas going out, gunpowder making, paper making. Uh, th these are all uh, associated with connectivity, right? Uh, and then here, uh, just to not focus on China-related goods or commodities or people, uh, it's also other things, other places that initiate uh, the connectivity, right? So one thing that during the course of my own research, I found this very interesting ship, a clipper um, uh, that was built in Baltimore. Uh, its name was called Frolic, F-R-O-C-L-I-C, uh, which was built in uh, Baltimore, uh, owned by a uh, New England uh, merchant community uh, traders, uh, who basically traded in opium between uh, India and China. This ship, this clipper was running between China and India in, after the Opium War 1845 onwards. And then when the California gold rush came, uh, the ship then tried to go to California, taking what? Taking Chinese uh, porcelain and Chinese timber uh, to California. It had a crew that was made up of Malay, uh, Chinese, uh, Indians, uh, and it reached California but got shipwrecked. Uh, so you can see this ship that was built in Baltimore, worked between China and India, using Chinese commodities, hands up, uh, in California, I think the fascinating part of an uh, instance where you see global China uh, uh, using China as perhaps a connectivity point, but not related only to China. Right? Uh, and then that brings to my third aspect, which I think Tim was also mentioning, uh, global China as method, right? I mean, this if you want to use that, that concept of uh, certain things as, as method. Uh, I, I think Ching Wang Bi in her recent article in China Quarterly has pointed that out how when we study uh, China and the world, uh, that was the original uh, way in which we looked at China to not just China center ourselves, uh, is to look at the other side, uh, how China connected to Africa, for example, in, in case of Chiwang Li, in case of me is India. Uh, can we look at China from the other side? Can we use sources, documents, data from other places to study China? Right? So if you look at Paul Cohen's book about uh, covering um, basically the uh, American scholarship of China, uh, and, and, and when he writes a uh, new prefers to that book um, in 2010, he points out that what, what he was proposing initially was a China-centric study of China. Then he emphasizes that China-centric study is not just about China, it's about the world as well. Uh, and I think that method of studying China from the outside not forgetting that, yes, this connectivity, this global China also has sources, data from outside becomes relevant, especially now when access to China may be limited, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when we can't perhaps do ethnographic research in China, can the global play a role in studying China? And I think that is a method that we should be talking about. Can we bring in sources from outside, perspectives from outside and study China through, through that kind of a perspective as well? Thank you. This is actually a very good point, especially nowadays, right? And how can we study China from outside? And also, I want to now uh, ask a question to a uh, team uh, that is also related to this global, local, uh, that I think can also sometimes create a dualism, right? When we talk about global China, I think it can be similar to China and the world because you create separations, right? But sometimes there are no separations. And so often global China is a reflection of domestic China, things that happen within. And sometimes it's less about China going out, uh, but more about how global forces of capitalism, as you mentioned before, Tim, shapes China from within. 
And in particular, if you look at infrastructures, the, what are those global forces and how are they shaping infrastructure development within and without uh, China? Uh, and can you uh, also talk a bit more about this uh, uh, China-made project, maybe referring to one example uh, from there so that we can better understand this uh, global local connection? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just start with a couple of just brief points about the China Made project, um, which we are wrapping up now. It's been going since 20, 2018, roughly. And we, we started that project with two main issues in mind. And, and one was that we were really interested in the infrastructure turn um, in both the humanities and the social sciences. We were interested in thinking about um, uh, you know how uh, thinking about infrastructures in some really interesting ways, but we were we were very curious about the fact that most of the scholarship coming out of the infrastructure turn was not addressing China and um, China's China's <laughs> world's paradigmatic infrastructure state. It's it's uh, in, you know infrastructure is is baked into uh, statecraft and. Um, uh, the, the party state system in, in China in, in ways that uh, that few other countries um, can compare. And, and so we were just really curious about, so we wanted China made to facilitate a conversation between um, a kind of a broader infrastructure's turn in, in, in the academy and the China studies field, I suppose. Um, at the same time, we, we, we were starting the project out when there was um, increasing interest in the Belt and Road Initiative in China as a global development actor. And we were finding that um, there was a, a, a real disconnect between people who were looking at what China was doing in other parts of the world and how they were understanding or, or lack of thereof, I suppose, of the domestic processes within China and the histories within China that were very much um, driving a lot of what China was doing um, abroad. And so we wanted to facilitate those kinds of connections as well. And so this leads right to your question about um, kind of domestic China and uh, looking at global and local issues at the same time, because we very much framed the project around trying to do that. Um, and I can just, you know, so I'll say in a, in a, in a general sense, um, our approach was to to focus on projects, and 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 it was an infrastructure focus. So, so we were primarily interested in 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 projects about connectivity and and um, and those kinds of things. But but we wanted to kind of take a focus that focused on the, on the projects themselves, and see them as kind of um, assemblages that brought in actors who were domestic actors within China um, who were coming at it that these projects or being involved in these projects for very local domestic reasons within China, um, but also uh, local actors within the sites where these projects were being developed in, you know, for example, in, in Thailand or, or um, you know, wherever, wherever Laos or wherever it was. Um, and so we, we kind of tried to think about the project itself as a unit of analysis uh, rather than, and, and, the, and the infrastructural connections as units of analysis rather than, um, rather than a particular country or a region or something like that. Um, and that would bring out the, the flows and connectivities um, that connected um, kind of local and global processes more, more, more directly or uh, as part of the analytical framework. Um, I guess I could, you know, one, one example, uh, one of our core team members, uh, Max Hirsch, who has worked for a long time on airport infrastructures and airports in and ur airport urbanism in China. He wrote a great book on airport ur urbanization um, in China. And his project in it for the for China Made was to focus on um, the ways that China developed airport construction expertise. Um, by importing a lot of, you know, by, by, by absorbing a lot of foreign expertise um, throughout the 1980s and 1990s. Um, so Max traced a lot of the involvement of foreign consulting firms and foreign experts and engineers and so on that uh, worked in China um, on airport development and brought, you know, experience from UK and from France and other parts of the world and from the United States. And the ways that China then kind of absorbed and in some ways indigenized some of those um, some of that knowledge uh, 
and, and repackaged it in, in a way that it could then export it um, as kind of part of its own quote unquote model, um, uh, doing it faster, doing it cheaper for other countries um, in the world where those uh, foreign experts who had initially consulted with China would not, would not, would not have worked. Um, and so the, the, his contribution was then to show how, um, how a lot of the infrastructural models and developments that were going on in China were, were an amalgamation of all sorts of uh, external influences coming from all different parts of the world, but primarily Europe and, and North America, and how they would get um, uh, absorbed and indigenized and then kind of re, re, retranslated, so to speak, and repackaged as, as um, a Chinese export product. And so we were, you know, we were really interested in those kinds of circular connections and and thinking about um, a particular form of infrastructure in this case, kind of airport infrastructures as a as an analytical tool to kind of see those connections. Thank you. And uh, actually, I will build a bit on on, on this uh, to ask Lauren. Lauren has uh, studied a lot of projects of uh, sort of uh, translation and export of this. Uh, uh models outside and, and i read recently uh one short piece uh, that you wrote about leki the port of leki in nigeria uh, that was funded and built by china um and uh, in the article you mentioned how the arrival of the mega ship from shanghai has been perceived as a historical moment by nigeria uh, at the same time of course there is uh, all this uh, bad media uh, on china china debt trap and so forth uh, um and so could you use uh, the example of Leki, um, of Chinese investment in Africa to discuss uh, China-Africa relations and also this uh, repackaging of, uh, you know, what China has learned, as Tim uh, uh, has mentioned, and export it to another country? And in particular, thinking about this China model, is it really this uh, China model of China going out? What is so unique about China? Uh, thanks, uh, Lauren. This is um, so the the piece I wrote on the Lecky Port was an op-ed, and the reason I wrote the op-ed is because I, I felt that no one was kind of observing this quite significant infrastructural this quite significant infrastructural turning point, which is the construction of the first ever deep water port in Nigeria, which is. Africa's biggest economy, biggest population, and so on. And the ship that arrived wasn't a ship on, on a normal trade. It was a construction ship. So it was bringing some cranes to complete the completion of the port. Um, and so the final port, the port will be open, um, I think, later next year. And so I, I wrote about that because it's like two demographic giants kind of coming together and ultimately this will presumably be quite explicitly connected to the new free trade and the emerging free trade zone in Hainan. There's even, there, there's an explicit trade route in that direction. Um, and I, I think one thing it's interesting for also is that many of these ports being built now are built with digital technology built into them. So there won't even be many labor gains directly from the port. It won't employ many people. It's it's a very automated modern port to be administered between a Nigerian company and I think a, a Singaporean company. And so it's just a kind of a new entity on a whole lot of levels and it will open up Nigeria to a much, much higher volume of international trade than in the past. So we haven't yet seen how that evolves. I did read some comments. The comments, the, the piece attracted an awful lot of comments, some of which were Nigerians saying that the port was just being built for Nigeria, Africa's richest man, um, you know, Dan Gonti, and that it was really just all about his business, you know, shipping in and out and so on, so that it was, it, it wouldn't necessarily foster an inclusive growth in, in Nigeria, it would do the opposite. Um, and others, you know, were, were keen for this fostering of international trade and maybe opening up to landlocked countries behind Nigeria or north of Nigeria. Um, so I, I don't know how typical 
that is. Again, I mean, just even the China-Africa narrative, Africa's 54 countries, I mean, and different people, different places, different times. Uh, I, I guess I, I, building on what Tim said, what I think is just so challenging about global China is that it just requires such an absurd amount of knowledge and information and data gathering than just studying China. You know, you, you, can't, you have to have this perspective, whichever country or region you're looking at, you have to have a, a bit of a local understanding in multiple, multiple histories and multiple. So I think it makes, like as a field of study, it's incredibly complex because do you ever kind of have the sufficient combination of, of knowledge, background and technical skills and so on? So I think it's incredibly complex. And then, Nason, fascinating on your point of studying from, from outside versus inside. When I did my, I did my a trade model of China's global imports for my PhD thesis, but I was really interested in the Africa results. And I tried both ways to, to study using the aggregation of the trade data of all the countries trading with China and then using China's data and that the, there was just no way the model would run using the aggregation of everyone else's data. Like there was no consistency in looking at China from outside in on a trade data level, both by the way those countries compile their trade, maybe slight differences, but also just there was kind of nothing systematic. There was nothing in common. Or, like the model simply collapsed in the first instance. It was dead before it started. But using Chinese data, it was it worked quite smoothly. And so I, I don't know if that's a good analogy um, or what that means in any bigger sense, but you know, like kind of studying out going in, I think it's from I, I guess my economic sense tends to be a kind of outside looking at China's investment into these countries. And as an international and development economist, I guess I've always taken China Global for granted, partly because I'm Australian and I, you know, grew up in 1990s Australia, and that was really China glo already. You know, there was a lot of global China already in my in my existence and at university, and then I was in China speaking, sorry, in Sierra Leone, Guyana. Um, but I think it's just so complex in how much knowledge is required to 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 get that sense. So it requires much more coordination, as Tim was saying, of just gathering so many different people with their different, what they bring. So I, it requires a much more cooperative academic environment to really do it well, I think. Thank you. And I think also, because now there is a lot of uh, big data and also this mapping global China and aggregation of data, but still it doesn't provide the uh, the best picture. Sometimes it confuses you even more, right? If the data are different. So there's like big data, run great numbers, but then we still are puzzled when we talk mm -hmm. about global China. We still don't understand. Uh, and now I want to actually ask a question, uh, Hansen, uh, again, as a historian, we take advantage of you uh, being here with us. Uh, if you can tell us a bit more about uh, global China, the very history of this concept, of this idea, because is it something new that just appear now? Chim Wang Yi think is one of the key person that uh, helped like, popularizing this, uh, this term, uh, but yeah, has been around for a long time. And also how is this different, like this global China from the past? You gave some hints before about connectivity, the project that you mentioned, Dong Huang, but yeah. Yeah, I think uh, uh, this concept may be uh, new, but uh, connectivities uh, existed uh, earlier on. Um, I, I think it has been formulated uh, into a discipline uh, or becoming a discipline. That's something we'll be talking later. But the idea that uh, China was connected to the world uh, uh, is historical, uh, and then we find that even before the common era. Uh, the idea is, again, um, I, I see the problem with the data uh, and then we see the same problem with the Chinese historical data uh, because the Chinese historical data is so neat and then we just depend on that. Uh, and then the idea of global China is going to challenge that data 
at historical records uh, from China. Uh, it's not so neat, it's, it's more complex. Uh, I think the global China idea adds this complexity to the historical period uh, that China did not really develop uh, just by itself. They were outside external agencies. Uh, and I think that's what Paul Cohen was pointing out in the study of Chinese history. We had to account for not only the Chinese agency in China, but also the external agency that clearly shows up in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, but it shows up earlier on with Buddhism, for example, right? I mean, there is an external agency that changed China, right? I mean, and China changed uh, how Buddhism came into China and then out of China. So, so I think that aspect uh, of a globe, uh, what we call the post Columbian globe, uh, I call it the world. I mean, so before the North and South Americas were discovered, China was linked to Europe, China was linked to South Asia, China was linked to Southeast Asia. And that for me is local China, historically speaking. Uh, but nobody really articulated that can be a field of study as discipline. Uh, what is that field of discipline still needs to be worked out. I think this is the same issue with world history uh, as a field. Right? It's, it's a complex thing. You need lots of uh, knowledge about different languages and, and so forth. You need to understand the local regions outside China, you need to understand China. It's not an easy field. Uh, I, I think that's the most important thing if you move forward is that looking back at history, how China was connected to many other societies, many other civilizations, learn from it, contributed to their knowledge. But I, I think it is a very important part of knowledge production mm -hmm. uh, about China, right? How do we learn about China through this aspect of its connectivity to the outside world? So taking lessons from history, uh, uh, historical documents that are from outside places on China, right? uh, Korea, Japan, for example, are important uh, for studying China historically, right? Uh, and in the same time, uh, in, in contemporary period as well, I think what people have collected about China, how they engage with China, what their perspective on China is, I, I think mm -hmm. is quite, quite important. So I think historically, this idea of global China existed. It was not articulated. Uh, it has been articulated now. Uh, I think it's, it has to do with the issue of globalization. It has to do with modern contemporary study of politics, but I think it is relevant historically as well. Thank you. So as we're already like 15 minutes away from the end of this uh, great session, um, I would like to ask you all a very, I mean, it's not quick because it's actually a, lot, it's a big question, uh, but uh, with the short answer. So do you think global China can be a new field of knowledge? And if so, what do you think is its uh, trajectory also for students that are interested in understanding China today and all its different articulations in the world? And also considering that uh, it's very hard to access China nowadays. And hopefully this will change very soon. But right now, there's many challenges for people that are interested in learning and studying China. Uh, I would like to start from Hansen. Let's start, uh, let's revert. Yeah, I think it's, it's worth doing it. Uh, I think it will give us perspective insights into China uh, that perhaps has not uh, been there for, for a long time. Uh, and, and the circumstances also makes it unnecessary. So as you know, we have a program for Global China Studies. Um, I also run a center called Global Asia Studies. So maybe if there's no global Australia, there's a global Asia. <laughs> and then that has been articulated uh, in the AS. It has become, is becoming an important field of study. Uh, and I think uh, in the same way as Global China uh, can develop uh, into a field, it's not easy to do. I, I think uh, the articulation of the concepts, articulation of the methodology needs to be done. Uh, and I think it's worth doing it. Uh, it will give us insights, not only of China, within China, but the whole globalized connectivity of China, not only through modern issues, but also migration is an important concern of, of, of historical and identity purposes. How through the migration of, of, of earlier labor, and current labor is China connected to the world, right? So I, I think it, it's it's a it's a field. I would say it's a developing field. Uh, a lot needs to be done, but I think that is the direction uh, we should be taking. Thank you, uh, Tim. Yeah, <clears throat> um, definitely. 
not a new field of knowledge, or at least not a new set of, uh, not new questions or something like that, but, a, but I think um, it's becoming institutionalized and becoming, um, you know, part of the makeup of kind of the China studies, uh, Asian studies, area studies, um, more, more uh, specifically now. And I think it, it partially took the pandemic, I think, to fuse all of that together, um, to get to really force people to think about, you know, their research in, in, in some new and uh, uh, flexible ways. Um, but I think it also took Xi Jinping um, to not just in terms of kind of making China a more aggressive global actor, but also making those of us who kind of account on certain research um, uh, access and those kinds of things within China to understand that, no, we can't just always count on those. Um, even before the pandemic, uh, doing the kind of research that I do in China was becoming much, much more difficult for um, political and, and, other, and other reasons. And so I think those developments have really forced a lot of people to really think in different terms about what research on and about China looks like and what it can look like. And so that combined with other things has really kind of um, turbocharged, I suppose, the idea of global China. And I think we're going to see more and more positions, more and more programs um, developing around this, this idea and around this framework, uh, more centers, more, more degree programs and certificates and these kinds of things in, in global China studies. I think we're gonna see a lot more of that over the, the next several years. So. Right now, we're seeing a real kind of flourishing of that, and I, I don't know where 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 it'll go, but I think it's 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 uh, even if you know we get to a point where research access opens up again in China and the pandemic isn't as much of an issue, I think the way, <clears throat> the way people think about doing research on China has has fundamentally changed because of this, um, and and that that will continue to be be a difference um, going into the future. Thank you, Tim, uh, Lauren. Yeah, thanks. Um, on the kind of recent changes in trajectory, if you followed the um, the if you the foreign direct investment data trend over time, it was always projected that around two thousand and fourteen, outbound investment would exceed inbound investment into China. So this is kind of, and that was basically roughly when she launched the um, Belt and Road Initiative when you know, around this turning point and also this demographic turning point in terms of China's population aging and and so on. And so now China is kind of going out in search of demographic dividend growth elsewhere, just as the world went to China. So, you know, so why is China and Africa different? One reason is just timing. Like there, there was a massive demographic dividend in East Asia in the second half of last century you know, that's now fading. So obviously how East Asia, including China, structurally relates to the world is going to shift quite dramatically. And whether or not large demographic countries elsewhere from India to Nigeria in the future, you know, in any way equivalently grasp their demographic dividend, will itself shape global China? You know, China decided to kind of as I would put it, suck the life out of its demographic dividend. That doesn't mean future demographic dividend countries will do the same and will they be as big. So that itself will shape China global. And in terms of a, a, a future for China global or global China, sorry, I'm, I'm defaulting to my, I think I prefer China global. Um, so you can even think, is there an implicit difference in the two phrases? Um, I, what I think, like, I would love to see people who study international law taking a China global course. And I would love to see people who study mainstream political economy or whatever, or diplomats or any kind of bureau, even politicians taking a global China. Like, I don't think you should be able to be a foreign minister until you've taken a, a global China course. Um, just because you know you don't even have any of those reference points, and yet you're in a space that is just so utterly influenced by global China. Um, so I think there's an enormous need for global China, China global studies. Um, 
do I think like I, I don't know how you shape a whole degree in that um but do I think there's like an enormous need yes I think almost anyone operating in certain specialties diplomats international law humanitarian I think they all need to take a, a, a global China course to be honest so there is a huge future it's just who who is the best people to take it maybe that's different whether a master's degree or or every foreign diplomat or whatever I, I don't know Thank you. Uh, the question I guess is also what what this course will uh, include, uh, right? And uh, I mean, and then when you Shanghai, we're like a global China studies, where like yeah, so hopefully well, there will be more students taking those classes. And also, I think when we talk about global, we should you know global China to avoid uh, falling again into ex exceptionalism. We should maybe talk about uh, global India, uh, global Italy. Why not, right? So if you really want to avoid refalling into this uh, exception, exception is trapped, you should really rethink about what global studies also mean and uh, this global lens through which we look at uh, China. Um, are there any questions? Uh, I don't see. Yeah, I think, I think people can type uh, questions in the chat, uh, Q and A box uh, and, and I think uh, they can moderate. Yeah. But I, I, would, I, I can add a one more important reason for doing uh, Global China. I think this is associated with both Global Studies and Global Asia, is the interdependencies that have emerged uh, during the last 15 years or so, how, how uh, regions have become interdependent uh, on each other for various kinds of supplies of goods and, and labor and, and things. So I think those interdependencies would perhaps increase in the future. Uh, as Lauren was pointing out, I, th I think the, the lack of, of labor that is going to affect China in, in, in the future, how is China going to deal with that? Uh, uh, they are now bringing labor to Africa and other places. Will they then bring in labor within China? I mean, that would be a big deal, right? So this interdependencies might increase in the future as, as we go along. So how do we respond to that? And, and I totally agree with Lauren that it would become very important to study that global China part uh, to formulate their own policies, uh, especially in India, for example. Uh, we look at China from this uh, China-centric point of view, forgetting China has other global concerns. Uh, and, and if we are going to make an Indian foreign policy on China, it should be global China that they should be looking at <laughs> uh, because China is present in Australia, China is present in, in Africa. So you can't just formulate a policy on China just without looking at other places where China is making inroads into, right? I mean, that's global China. At the same time, I also think that it's important not inflating the uh, control of the central government uh, over this global China. But I think there is the assumption very often that, uh, you know, there's a Chinese Communist Party, it controls everything, everything that happened globally. So I think in reality, it's so much more complex, uh, uh, chaotic uh, than that. So that's also very important to keep uh, in mind when we talk about global China. That is also very fragmented and chaotic. There isn't really one uh, monolith. It's not a monolith. Yeah. Can I ask a question to Tim? Sure. Tim, since you mentioned you use uh, uh, Victor's and my book in your class, uh, how in the context of global China do you use it? <laughs> well, I, I use the book. Um, I've used the book in the past for my. Uh, so I teach a. I do teach a geography. Uh, sorry, I, I do teach a global China class right now, and I'm actually not using the book in that class. But I use. I've used it in my geography of China class, and so, in that class, um, I've I've spent time looking at historical geography, looking at the importance of frontiers, looking at. Um, different ways of understanding the frontier um, and, and the political sensitivities of the frontier from the Chinese uh, political perspective, um, the issue of, of, of you know, the, the Xinjiang mummies and, and, and so on and so forth. And so um, your book was really helpful in kind of really offering very nice, um, digestible, concrete case study examples for students to really understand how um, a lot of the narratives that we get about China as the center of the world <laughs> um, can be complicated by um, by looking at um, you know how kind of really fundamental cultural influences that have come um, 
from other parts of the world, but 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 I was particularly interested in frontier spaces as kind of contact zones and spaces within which um, new kinds of cultural formations would occur that would then become very central to to China um, and and so trying to think about frontier spaces as not peripheral but central. Um, we also use some of Jim Millward's work on uh, the PIPA, for example. Um, and and so students, but students really appreciated um, the book that you guys did because it was, it's it's pitched at just the right level and, and no, has we, a lot We are of updating it, uh, there's a new, new edition that will come out soon. Oh, good, was, that's great to hear. Yeah, so there was one question actually that was good uh, about the use of global, that you think global XX, is it, uh, um better like so it, you know when, when you refer to global south for instance because when you use global usually it's referred to global capitalism the global north and so or is it a good term to use uh does anybody of you want to quickly answer for for, for the reason global in, in the case of global asia for example uh it is is there because you know the connectivity part the presence of asia is across the globe yeah. It's, it's not limited to any other region or within that region. So the presence of China these days is it's not just about political China, but Chinese goods and Chinese commodities can, are, are linked to different yeah. parts of the globe. And that's why uh, it, it matters from South America yeah. to, to, to North America, to, to Australia, to New Zealand. I think the presence of, of China is everywhere. Uh, yeah. So I think uh, that's, that's why the globe matters, I guess. Yeah. And also, I think it's partly, I think, referring to this question is an empowering term, right? That because now it's taken seriously. China has become global, right? And so I think I would like to thank you all. Uh, this conversation may be even more confused about what is global China, but I think it's great. Uh, and uh, so thank you, all of you, for uh, giving your time and speak to us and for all the people that attended the session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.